prohibitively expensive and uh, yeah it's a one in 12 so uh we'll see i'll report back on that <laughs> but I i'm think, glad we're uh, getting back to our yeah, podcast like, roof roots and talking about vented and unvented <laughs> roofs uh that's what we do here sure Welcome to the Fine Home Building Podcast, our weekly discussion of building, remodeling, and design topics aimed at anybody who cares deeply about the craft and science of working on houses. This is Senior Editor Patrick McComb. Today I'm joined by Fine Home Building Contributing Editor Ian Schwant. Hello. Producer Jeff Rose. Hi there. And special guest Keegan McAuliffe. Please email your Hello. questions to F... Sorry, Keegan. Email your questions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. You can find previous podcasts and check out the show notes at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. Well, it's good to see you guys this morning. Thanks for being here. Yeah, thanks for having us. Keegan, you're going to have to introduce yourself to folks uh, here. This is your first time on the podcast. It's a pleasure to have you here. Uh, can you tell us uh, what you do, where you live, and uh, how you got started doing it? Sure, yeah. Thanks for having me. Um, I live in Sandpoint, Idaho, which is way up at the top, um, about an hour from Canada. And I am in the process of building my own house right now. And uh, Ian, actually, I, I reached out to Ian many months ago for an uh, energy modeling spreadsheet that he had. And we kind of connected over that. And we've been going back and forth about that. And uh, so, yeah. Just taking advantage of all the resources from you guys and working on my own house right now. And you're a builder by trade, right? Yes, general contractor. And um, are you currently working on customers' projects while you're building your own house? I am not. I decided to uh, just take a break and try to get it done as fast as possible. So we're six days a week, seven days a week, uh, just going for it. Yep. So I think in the after show, we're going to talk to you more about your house, uh, your business before you started building it, and uh, what it's like to live in Sandpoint, Idaho, because uh, everything I've heard is absolutely an amazing place. Are you a native to the area? I am not. I moved here about six years ago uh, from Northern California. I grew up about an hour north of San Francisco, Sonoma County. And Sandpoint is booming, am I right? It is. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. So we'll talk more about that. Ian, what have you been up to? You told me you're all riled up. I can't wait to hear why. <laughs> oh, I'm just I'm, I'm ready to start this uh, new build that we've got going, going back and forth with the bank on fun stuff like draw schedules and uh, payment schedules and lining up the trade partners. It's, uh, Can I ask, isn't that normally the client's uh, b uh, job to get the money lined up? What's, uh, what's so your the, involvement the money, there? The money's lined up, but... But I want it in a specific interval to make sure that it works for our cash flow. Sure. So I'm, I'm deep into the, the cash flow management this week, and it's got me really excited. Uh <laughs> <laughs> Come on, Patrick. You know me. It's 100% about money 100% of the time. I, I will just let that all go. That is fantastic. Uh, Jeff, just what have you been up to? Let that one hang there. <laughs> um, I'm doing a little bit of spring cleanup, but mostly uh, editing uh, next um, uh, premium learning class. Uh, this is a fine home building product, right? Uh, no, no. Or, fine, excuse me, fine woodworking. Yes, yep. So it, it's uh, surface carving, introduction to surface carving with Michael Cullen. So that's kind of cool. Has it inspired you to want to do carving? Um, well, actually, I, I wanted to do it because uh, I edited a video that he did, Michael did uh, a few years ago on bandsaw boxes, and he did a lot of surface embellishment with, and I, I was intrigued by watching him do that. And cool. so it's kind of nice to get this introduction because it, it's like, it, it's approachable, more approachable than I thought it would be. Cool. Yeah. What, what uh, are you going to edit? Go ahead. When are you going to edit the 495 ways to cut dovetails by hand video? That's the one I'm interested <laughs> oh, I, in watching. I, I did that one. <laughs> Dovetail boot camp with Bob yeah. Van Dyke. Yeah. That's right. What kind of species uh, is best for the kind of surface carving you're talking about, Jeff? Um, I think 
Well, my, Michael recommended uh, basswood, um, at least for an initial start, but, you know, mahogany, walnut, um, cherry. Mm. I think I'll any of your straight grain, non-interlocking grain woods uh, will will work pretty good for that, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Have you uh, attempted any of this, Ian? So when I had my shop in New York, my shop mate, Alan Webb, is a classically trained British carver who worked for a very large framing outfit in Manhattan when he first came here from England. And one of the projects that he did was he carved all, if not most, of the carved mirror frames at the Bellagio Hotel in Las Vegas. That's so awesome. Uh, you know, uh, much of Las Vegas is super tacky, and the, the Bellagio has its uh, elements there. But uh, other stuff is amazingly beautiful, and uh, what you're talking about, the carved stuff is amazing, and it has amazing mosaic floors, too, so... Yeah, I'd I mean, like to say that I learned some of it by osmosis being with him for a couple of years, but uh, I'm pretty terrible. I can do some <laughs> letters, and that's that's about it. Keegan, have you given uh, carving a shot ever? I am uh, not a carver. No, never really gotten I, into that. I did either, act right? Actually, I checked that. I did, as a kid, I carved a wooden egg with an X-Acto knife, and I slit my knee open. So that was kind of the last, uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's what I've always observed about carving. It seems like a good way to stab yourself. There you go. <laughs> I want to do a plug the retrofit podcast that Ryan Shanahan from um, Bird's Mouth Construction has been running over at GBA. I've been listening to a couple, and I, I think it's great. I think you all should check it out too, and if, especially if you have an interest in uh, energy improvements of older homes, it seems like the place to go. And uh, Ian, there was a milestone today in the Fine Home Building podcast email box. I don't know if you knew this, but you're now officially getting spam emails. So I think I, that is something to celebrate. I, I had no idea. What, what did I get? Did it, uh, <laughs> did it have anything to do with like hair growth or any, <laughs> any other kind of typical spam stuff that we'll, we'll leave off the radio for now? Yeah, I, I think we'll have to revisit, uh, you know, what it was. But um, how long have you been doing the Pro Talk podcast? So I think I started doing some of them maybe last fall. I want to say maybe like October was my my first one when you offered to hand some of them off. And I, I want to say I've been on the, the main show on and off now for well over a year. What do you think? I'm sure you have regrets about all of it. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, I love being on here with you. I'm, I'm here for you whenever you need me, you know that. You even gave well, me a title. I mean, isn't that cool? Yeah, no so you're a contributing now. editor, uh, and somehow we missed getting it in the uh, masthead this month. It was some snafu, but uh, next month, I promise. I'll, I'll, if, I, I'll, if I have to, I will write it in every issue that goes out uh, by my hand if we need to. There you go. I look forward to it. We were talking about um, what's going to happen to cellulose insulation when there's no more newsprint. And this is a question that came up on GBA once again. Martin Holiday dug into the uh, supply chain issues with cellulose manufacturing. And uh, I'll put a link to the um, Retrofit podcast and Martin's uh, article on the Fine Home Building podcast show page. Uh, here's, here's, a, here's a snippet here. Uh, advantages for insulation manufacturers include the long fibers found in old newspapers compared to office paper, which is more processed than newsprint. Cellulose manufacturers don't use magazine paper like office paper. It is more highly treated than newsprint, and magazines have a high clay contact that irks insulation manufacturers so your strategy ian to for people to shred their old fine home buildings to make insulation is sadly not going to work did i come up with that <laughs> i don't even remember all the dumb ideas i throw out there on the podcast anymore he's uh martin goes on to say fortunately old cardboard can be used to manufacture cellulose insulation but it takes more force to cut it up and fiberize than newsprint so it's harder on the hammer mills so i'm suggesting that cellulose manufacturers could just stop by my place and take all the amazon boxes that seem to accumulate all over so it's that's a <laughs> good thing to have to uh deal with i guess i don't know at least there's a use for the you know many more cardboard boxes that are out there i'm sure 
part of uh, this made me laugh. Uh, Martin's piece says, researchers look into the topic of paper recycling soon encounter several mysterious abbreviations, including ONP and OCC. These aren't obscure chemical compounds. They are down-home phrases. ONP stands for old newspaper. OCC stands for old corrugated cardboard. And older documents will also see the abbreviation OTD, which stands for old telephone directories. So there you go. When was the last time you guys saw a telephone directory? <laughs> yeah, no one's going to say. <laughs> so the, <laughs> the, while, the shop that yeah. Alan and I had, for whatever reason, like twice a year, Verizon would drop a giant telephone directory off on our front stoop. <laughs> and we would look at it and go, why? What are we going to do with that? <laughs> Up until like I don't know that not that long ago, I would see um, one ads for uh, Donnelly Directory sales reps and Yellow Page sales reps, and I'm just like, those folks have got a tough job, right? No one is <laughs> buying Yellow Page ads anymore. That's crazy. I'm guessing they don't even publish those things anymore. Maybe so online. when you find somebody who's a salesperson for the telephone directory, do you tell them, hey, why don't you come on over and? And be an editorial director at Fine Home Building would be an easier gig. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, I, yeah, both jobs are hard, I'm sure. Uh, as always, we heard from our great listeners. This comes from uh, Dosa Doodle on YouTube. On the, on the solar, uh, this was on our discussion of concrete use for building renewable energy facilities, both wind towers and um, utility scale PV arrangements. Uh, on the solar, the better projects do account for the amount of carbon in the concrete. For perspective, one solar panel will produce enough energy to save about a 5 by 5 by 5 cube of coal or other fossil gas equivalent. I've heard panels take on around 10% of the emissions they save to produce, so they start with a 90% savings. So even if each around 300-watt panel takes a cubic meter of concrete, a huge overestimate on any project on a per-pound basis, they'll still come out ahead of fossil fuels. In reality, it's probably closer to around 5% of a cubic meter of concrete. So we're still looking at about an 80% reduction in emissions. I find it uh, cool that they're at least looking at that uh, instead of just sweeping it under the rug, right? Keegan, does uh, your area have a boom in um, renewable energy production like much of the Mountain West? You know, we are uh, not there yet <laughs> by any means. Our The house I'm building has, it's a shed roof and it's 100% south facing. Um, it's a one in 12, so it's maybe not ideal for PV, but I did think about it and was thinking about putting conduit up to be able to retrofit in later really easily. And the electricity is, so we have a lot of hydropower here. Um, mm. so I guess that is renewable, but you know, the, there's a lot of controversy on the dams and everything as well. So, um, but yeah, energy is very cheap here and, uh, not many solar panels. We get a lot of cloudy days in the winter, so, um. Just everyone I talk to, it's just not really worth it where I am as far as PV goes. Do you, does Idaho have net metering rules or is that up to in, the individual utility? Do you know? Yeah, I, I haven't looked into it uh, on a granular level. Um, a lot of our stuff is tied to Spokane, Washington, uh, and the utility is over there because that's our closest big city. Mm -hmm. um, and Washington has much different rules. So it's kind of this weird thing where we're almost like a, a suburb of Spokane, but we're in a different state. So it doesn't uh, necessarily the rules, apply. The rules are, the rules are different. Um, yeah. So I haven't looked that deeply into that. Uh, this next email comes from... Sorry. Uh, I'll have to put on the podcast page. I'm sorry, whoever sent this in, I forgot to put your name on the script. Hey, podcast crew, I just have a few things I wanted to share after listening to recent episodes. First, in regards to the future of housing in episode 545, there was an interesting program the city of Philadelphia was doing for a while called Workforce Housing. The city was sitting on something like 29,000 vacant lots. So they would give, give a builder a lot if they build on it and sold the home for $230,000 to someone who earned 120% of area median income. This did a few things. It developed unused lots. It added 
starter homes to the new housing stock. Builders were incentivized to build. Uh, builders are incentivized to build large and luxurious homes. However, this price cap meant the homes were three bedroom, two bath, and about 1,500 square foot starter homes. This type of housing that uh, is desperately needed in the area. It helped people in the middle who don't get grants or assistance. And, and builders were not building modest stoner homes for. Also, the set price meant no bidding wars, just first come, first serve. There are deed restrictions that allows the homes to sell for about 10% higher each year for 10 years, 253,000. Uh, year one, 276, year two, et cetera. This allows the homeowner to realize equity and build wealth, but encourages them to stick around and not flip the house. I love this program. It was a great, great incentive to build needed housing stock without being too restrictive. Second, I wanted to echo the sentiment from Matt in D.C. from episode 533 about row homes. We need representation. I live and work as a home improvement contractor in Philadelphia. All of our housing stock here is densely packed row homes. Everything online is so oriented towards 50s to 90s 2 by 4 stick-built homes, and it takes days of digging to find any information on the homes I work on. Uh, which are generally from the 1800s, 13 to 15 feet wide with structural brick walls, lime mortar, party walls on both sides, field stone foundations, and flat rolled rubber roofs, horsehair plaster with no insulation. These factors are common in other older homes, but typically not altogether. A field stone foundation with a bloom frame house be behaves one way, but can I apply the same control layer strategy when there's a brick wall on top of that foundation? How about if the party wall has conditioned space on, bo space on both sides? There are so many layers with these homes, I often can't find content that addresses all of those factors together. All right, so what do you guys think? I totally agree. We need more representation of this kind of housing stock and fine home building and, and on the podcast. And uh, if any of you all work on these homes, I'd love to hear from you. Ian, have you had to work on homes like this in your travels? Uh, a little bit in New York City and in Poughkeepsie, New York, but uh, not not very often. Some interior work, and that's about it. Uh, for a while when we were traveling to D.C., a couple times uh, while we lived out in the Northeast, we always stayed at row houses, typically in like the garden level apartment. And I always thought they were pretty neat. We stayed at one that was really quite narrow, like 10, 10 feet wide or something. I was fascinated by uh, the layout of it. Yeah, uh, right. I, I totally agree. And I like the density and it makes for a walkable neighborhood that you actually uh, get some privacy on the back of it, but you can talk to your neighbors if you sit on the stoop and want to, you know, talk to people. Keegan, Keegan any in your, in your area, what do they do for uh, the workforce housing? Are there any, you know, local social programs like what the, the writer mentioned in Philadelphia? I know I'm sure you don't have very many empty lots in Sandpoint, but are there any, uh, local entities trying to promote that lower cost workforce housing yeah you know there's nothing nothing like row housing obviously it's a it's a really small town but um it is becoming more and more of an issue uh but i don't know i i think that the smaller footprint and the shared walls and all that is such a good idea for for lowering cost and lowering the barrier to entry um but most of the development is still geared towards just uh, kind of subdivision or tract housing. And they're all kind of these large, complicated roof line, you know, McMansion style. It's it's kind of hard to watch. Um, there is some, we have a ski mountain close by. And so they are building their own employee housing, uh, which is basically just a huge apartment building. Um, so there's a few of those going up, but it's your pretty standard, you know, vinyl clad, giant box um that's about it as far as shared shared housing or smaller unit kind of housing keegan is there any like masonry construction in sandpoint or is it all wood frame i'm guessing the latter yeah all wood frame uh we're surrounded by trees and uh <laughs> so that makes that makes the most sense uh if there is any masonry it's always just a, a veneer that's applied uh later on yeah. So that email was from Scott. I had a chance to look it up. Uh, thanks for writing in, Scott. And if you know of anyone who thinks an authority on this type of uh, construction, I would love to have them on the podcast and work with them for some fine home building content because there is a ton of stu this stuff out there, and often it's very affordable. And, uh, 
You see it a lot in, um, you know, former manufacturing areas of the country, especially, and on the East Coast. Uh, this comes from our friend Dave in Plainfield, Vermont. Hey, Patrick and folk, I forget which episode the podcast had someone asking about horizontal strapping as it relates to rain screens. I have some feedback. I believe it was Martin Holiday that has cedar shingles over his house with battens every five inches creating a rain screen. As I recall, he once spoke about removing some of the battens for one re- or shingles for one reason or another, and that many years after the original installation, the battens were still in good shape. I think we might generally overestimate the quantity of water that gets behind siding. If we have enough water getting behind our cladding to cause severe damage, we've likely done something else very wrong. To my mind, the best two things about a rain screen are they help paint stay on the siding longer and they give our exterior walls a handy space for vapor that accumulates all winter to dry in the spring. Maybe the term rain screen is a little misleading. Ventilated cladding system is better, but it doesn't exactly roll off the tongue and sounds supremely nerdy, which works for me and probably you, Patrick, but who knows how many glazed over eyes either of us can handle. Uh, I used a T111 ripped widthwise, making four foot long strips, installed it with the grooves toward the wall. I saw this tip in either FHB or JLC many years ago and thought, well, that's almost too simple to be true. It's inexpensive and perhaps more importantly, readily available. And it's good practice for young apprentices to earn to use the Cirrus saw safely and efficiently. This material wouldn't work great over rigid insulation, but if one were just installing a rain screen over house wrap and sheathing, this installs quickly and easily. That's it for the missive. I always have a gazillion thoughts when I listen to the podcast and a quadrillion questions swirling around my head that I think might make for good radio, so to speak, but I'll spare you this time. You all are doing a great job as ever. Thanks, Dave. Plainfield, Vermont. So uh, Dave is saying the grooves in T111 make natural like breaks in the batten so water that does get behind the siding can drain through the little holes. And I think that's pretty smart. Do you guys find rot behind siding? And if you had a rain screen, do you think it would help? I think so, especially if the the WRB or whatever you have behind the rain screen, be it house wrap or some fancy WRB or zip or uh, your favorite Patrick uh, roofing felt underlayment. Uh, I think the the rain screen or the ventilated cladding system uh, does a lot for uh, your siding and for your house in general. I think it's it's a big key of the double wall, dense pack cellulose uh, wall assembly. Because it allows better drying, Ian? Is that uh, your reasoning? I think it, it allows the, the ventilated space behind the cladding to, uh, to help equalize that moisture, yeah. But as you've pointed out in recent podcasts that I've been on with you, when it comes to vapor drive, if you're ventilating your whole house and you have uh, reasonably even pressure inside the house to outside of the house, vapor drive isn't quite the problem that we're sometimes led to believe. I think the important thing about rain screens is it kind of uh, stops the capillarity that can actually like bring water uh, up uphill in some cases. Right. Um, you know, if there's a big enough airspace, that doesn't work. And uh, I think that's a great attribute. Yeah, Christine Williamson has a lot of great stuff on her uh, overdriven fastener website about water column pressure and how without having that water column pressure, you don't have the ability of the capillary action to, as you said, move water against gravity. That's a crazy concept, right? Uh, If you have a small space, uh, water doesn't necessarily play by the normal rules of physics. Yeah, I think I've mentioned it before on the podcast, but when Andy Engel and I both worked for Hudson Valley Preservation, they had a, a project that Mason and Dave had built many years ago, and the clients had always called to complain about uh, a leak that they had at a certain very tall window that only happened in certain kinds of weather events. And Andy determined that it was when the rain came from the east during certain times of year when they had the pressure differential, which actually allowed the water to move up the exterior trim of the window 
and into a hole at I, I believe where the intersection of the arch transom hit the window. Another good reason not to put in arch transoms. <laughs> <laughs> You're gonna go full Kylie on us and start start trashing <laughs> architectural details twenty five minutes in. <laughs> yeah, it's that's uh uh, amazing phenomena, and, and you know, they're. If you told a, cl a client that, you know, they might look at you like you were nuts, but uh, you know, can't argue with science. This comes from uh, Dustin, who's uh, working on a new home design, and uh, thanks for listening to the podcast, Dustin. Hi, FHB crew. I'm ramping up to start construction on my own home this spring, and being a longtime FHB podcast listener, I had to run the plans by you and ask some questions. I'll be doing most of the build myself, so the design is simple and easy to build. It's located in the pinky of Michigan, considered a cold climate by Joe Steebrook on a flat two and a half acre site that used to be an apple orchard I'm hoping to bring back to life. I'll be using New Dura's R35 ICFs for my exterior wall assembly with LP siding. Heating and cooling will be handled by a seven series water furnace, forced air geothermal system, and a zender system for fresh air duties. Please take a look at the plans I drew and let me know what you think. Um, now the questions, uh, roof venting, what is the best practice for venting a hip roof with metal roofing? I'm fine with just a ridge vent or do I need to vent the hips as well? I'm also wondering where to place the venting along the Southern overhang slash soffit with a six foot overhang. Do I still vent on the outer edge or closer to the house? All right. So we take these one at a time. You guys tell me. Yeah, let's do them one at a, one at a time. Do you have thoughts on roof venting a hip roof, Ian? Uh, I think because he's using metal vent the deck, so do the rain screen style battens on the deck. And then put the metal on top of that? Yeah, vent the deck. Why? I think that's a more natural application for the um, metal roofing. I think you could get away with a standard venting procedure if you had a gable, but... Uh, depending on how the hip is constructed, I think it might be easier just to vent the the actual roof deck. Keegan, you got thoughts on this? Yeah, not not too much. I haven't done a lot of uh, hip roofs, um, so I was I was a little stumped on this one. I I wasn't sure what to what to offer on that, but I yeah. I'm going to say, why vent it at all? I mean, but of course, this is a tough climate. And it's, uh, you know, if there's reason to vent a roof, it's because you have a cold, wet climate and it needs to dry in the summertime. But uh, hip roofs are hard to vent. And uh, uh, the problem is you don't have enough ridge vent compared to the amount of soffit vent. And uh, um, I think there's a detail in the GBA library that shows some ways to do this. And it might be mushroom vents or it might be uh, venting the hips. And I don't know. I've seen if, both applications yeah. quite often on asphalt. Uh, but again, the, the metal to me just seems like, why don't you just vent the deck? Uh, it's not going to add much in terms of cost, right? You've got your underlayment is something you're going to have to do regardless of if you vent the deck or not. Um, maybe the metal trims are a little bit different. You have some different detailing at your eaves, but uh, I, I think it's a good option to vent the deck. This this roof doesn't have a lot of pitch, so I'm a little worried that right. any of this is going to work uh, at all. That's a good so point. You, might, you might consider a, you know unvented roof assembly because I'm not sure how good it's going to work with this low slope. Keegan, you mentioned your roof is a very low slope. Are you doing anything with that roof assembly to vent it? Oh man, this is the my roof is kind of the uh, it's been a <laughs> it's been a really hard one over the last couple of months. We're doing kind of a I would call it a vapor diffusion style roof. Um, I have a 20 in, 29 inch tall parallel cord truss, um, and we opted to basically dense pack the entire thing uh with the assumption that it's going to settle a little bit over time it's not a full like four psi dense pack it's just a dense pack to make sure they got it all full um so we're at over r100 
And so the idea being that it's going to be, uh, it's going to stay pretty dry. We have a really good sealing air barrier with taped OSB. Um, so the idea being that it won't get too wet and whatever does will, will diffuse, but it's, it's unvented and it's cellulose. So it's, I don't know, I'll report back in a few years if I'm composting my roof sheathing. Um, <laughs> I'm a little worried about it to be honest, but I didn't, I did, really didn't want to use foam. It was prohibitively expensive and, uh, yeah, it's a one in 12. So, uh, we'll see. I'll report back on that. <laughs> But I'm think, glad we're getting uh, back to our yeah, podcast like, roof roots and talking about vented and unvented <laughs> roofs. Uh, that's what we do here. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Um, Dustin, right? Dustin uh, goes on to ask, uh, should I open, okay, leave the staircase open or enclose it? The forced air system I'm installing will have an upper level and basement as its only two zones. Does it make sense to enclose the staircase to separate the two areas for heating slash cooling purposes? I'd prefer an open staircase, but worry about the basement losing heat to the upstairs in the winter and the upstairs losing its AC downstairs in the summer. Am I overthinking this? Yeah, I think so. If you've got two, uh, centri- uh, two pieces of equipment, if you're trying to zone damp this, I don't know if it's going to work as well. But if you have two pieces of equipment, you can make enough hot or cold to keep all of it comfortable, I'm sure. You were nodding, Ian. You you agree? I've rarely agreed with you quite <laughs> as uh, quite as totally as I agree with you in that statement. Uh, Jeff, uh, you have one system, or do you have two in your big place? It's one system. It is zoned, but you know, it, it's meaningless because it's a big open space. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I yeah, think... and, and I think if, as long as the air sealing is done, that's what creates the convection right you got to start with a tight house for any of this to work is your point right it's like yeah yeah if if the house is all hemorrhaging heat out the top yeah it's it's not going to be comfortable similarly if it's getting a solar gain from the roof uh yeah totally one of the things that i picked up from the net zero building class at yestermorrow was that once you go to the extent of building your your wall assembly to that R35 to R40 with really good air sealing like Dustin's going to be doing with his ICFs, you you can, instead of going the manual J route and thinking about each room as its own condition space, you can start to think about the totality of your building as one condition space. Good luck finding a an HVAC contractor who's used to thinking in those terms uh, instead of, you know, rule of thumb sizing and whatever other voodoo they use to figure out how big equipment should be. <laughs> well, I think Keegan can, would say that's, can that's confirm. a big, big part of uh, <laughs> the energy model stuff that, that I was working on with him to be able to think about that structure as its own uh, single. Yeah. That- Dustin, shoot, shoot Ian an email and get that energy model from him. It's wildly helpful. I, I ran into this exact thing. I have uh, Dustin's exact situation. I've got a four foot wide staircase from the basement, which is hydronic, up to the upper level, which is a combination of uh, kind of mini face back mini splits and a wood stove. And it's the exact same situation. And the manual J that my HVAC contractor tried to run didn't go above r20 for the walls and i'm r40 and it was just totally useless so you um, mean there was no provision in his software to go beyond r20 like it seems like exactly, it needs an update he, oh my god he was worried about what my u factor was on my windows but it, he said he couldn't get he couldn't input higher than r20 or r21 which to me it was kind of like <laughs> who cares what the glazing is that's uh, anyway yeah uh, and I hear this is a, a nationwide problem, and I'm not surprised because folks have not been trained uh, to uh, size equipment and duck work for uh, supremely efficient homes. We're working on stuff that was probably come up with in the 50s as far as sizing rules that people are using. I think a lot of it comes down to the comments that I've heard from HVAC installers and techs where – if somebody wakes up in the middle of the night because their heat's out in February, they're not calling the carpenter. They're calling the HVAC guy, 
and and that's why they oversize systems and tend to use things that are within their uh, technical expertise to repair and troubleshoot. We were talking a little bit at la- about it last show, Ian, about thermal bypasses. If you size your equipment, assuming that it's going to be reasonably airtight, but your builders like leave giant holes in the envelope, there is no way anyone is going to be comfortable in that house. And as you suggest, they're calling the HVAC contractor, not the builder. I think the the inverse of that is true as well. I mean, in my case, where the HVAC guys are not used to you know, a house below one ACH or whatever. Um, and so they don't really know how to size for that. And honestly, ERVs are not even that common up here. And I, it's mandatory on my builds. I'm, I'm bidding a house right now and I made it clear to them that that was not an option. It's got to be in there cause it's going to be tight, but there's not that many houses up here being built with zip or anything like that yet. So, uh, yeah. It's hard. I can't wait to talk to you more about your uh, your builds and the lifestyle in Sandpoint because I'm guessing there's a lot of folks that heat with wood uh, either because it's tradition or because they love it. Um, but mm-hmm. I'm sure that affects the uh, HRV and, and all of it, right? Like you, you – yeah. Oh, I can't wait to talk about it. It's so cool. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Stay tuned for the after show, right? Yeah, it's going to be good. Yeah. Um, this comes from Brian in South Portland, Maine. Hey, FHB podcast, I borrowed a friend's laser level for doing some work in an unlevel basement and ran into an issue a couple of times where the beam on the level was too high, even when just lying the laser on the ground. I wound up creating a jig that allowed me to mark lines below the beam, but that kind of defeats the purpose of a laser. Admittedly, it was an unusual application with a cheaper priced unit. I'm wondering if this is something manufacturers have considered and if anyone makes a model that gets the beam lower to the ground. Some models look like they mount the beam more toward the middle, but it's not something I can get hard numbers on. Love the pod. Thanks for keeping it going and answering other questions I've sent in. Brian. So Brian's needs a low down laser, right? He needs one that... I'm guessing this was a tiny crawl space, right? Like, can, can you imagine a scenario where this would be a problem, Ian or Keegan? The only one that I can think of would be doing some work where you need to get a floor in plane. So, like, prep for some type of a flooring that doesn't have a lot of ability to deflect. So, you have to create a flat area uh, or possibly laying something out very low on a wall Uh, in either case if you're laying out something on a wall what i've done on projects is before anybody else is there get the laser out and mark a reference line all the way around the room and then usually in the corner i'll write the date that i did the reference line and that it is a reference line at level to be used for certain types of layout uh, but if it's flooring, you know, to me, you can't beat a mark on a stick doing the same thing and just going around the room with the laser set up in one spot. So make a, uh, in essence, a story pole with a stick, right? Yeah. You're, you're, you're putting the end of the stick where you want the floor plane to be and using a, a laser to line up a mark that's on the stick higher up than, yeah. than what you want. I got gotcha. you. One other trick that I learned very early in my apprenticeship from a guy who mostly did uh, high-rise buildings in Milwaukee was that if you're using an older laser or an inexpensive laser, you'll find that over a great distance, the beam keeps getting wider. Mm -hmm. So it's best to get in a habit of marking the center of the beam at all times because the center of the the beam of light will stay Uh, more even across a long, wide space. Can I guess that your projects in Northern California, Keegan, uh, required uh, some creative leveling owing to the hilly topography? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, definitely. We did some some funky floors for sure. Um, Lasers weren't as prevalent back then. I mean, there were definitely rotary lasers and stuff, but I... I now have the Stabila 300G or whatever, the um, plum dot and line laser, which is amazing. I use it literally every day. Um, 
but yeah, I think the beam's like three and an eighth off the floor or something like that. I can't remember. And, uh, I agree. Make a, make a story pole. If you're using a receiver, you know, put the laser up somewhere that's easy. You don't have to bend over and use a stick. That's the right length. Um, it's about all I've got as far as a suggestion for that. I like the idea of a detector because uh, you you can use the laser without being able to see it. It it it, it senses the beam and then beeps uh, usually with increasing frequency with how close you're getting to where your mark would be. It's pretty cool technology, and they used to be stupidly expensive, but I think they're probably two three hundred bucks now. Uh, I was going to bring up a water level. Uh, oftentimes, you know, like a, a water level is not perfect. Uh, and, uh, the cool thing about it though, is it, it reads level around corners and places where a laser beam is not going to go through. You can root a water level through a window opening or door opening or a hole in the band joist and, uh, transfer, uh, la la uh, planes, uh, horizontal planes beyond walls and obstructions, which is kind of a cool thing. And it's super cheap tool in Hard to, hard to mess up. I'm guessing. And a battery's never going <laughs> to die on your water level right in the middle of your work. A <laughs> uh, good question, uh, Brian. And uh, if you find a laser that you like better uh, in this in this situation, please let us know, and we'll tell other folks who, who are likely having the same problem. Uh, and if this you comes use from... a water level typically in your work, we want to hear that too. We want to hear what you use a water level for. You know, I've heard that the folks who move houses, that is their preferred reason. And of course it is because there's cribbing everywhere holding up the house, right? And there's yep. no way you could project a beam uh, to reach all corners of a, even a small structure. Old school acoustical tile people also, I believe, would be another frequent user of the water level. You mean like uh, the ceiling grid uh, installers? Yeah. Yep. It's funny at the tools events and trade shows I go to, everyone who makes lasers is selling some kind of bracket that goes on the wall angle. But um, once again, you know, uh, that's going to get stolen. <laughs> no one's going to steal some plastic tubing. <laughs> You've given me a good idea. I think. Sometime I'm going to go to one of those tool shows and I'm going to set up like a joke booth with like all of these weird old tools, like a, like a water <laughs> level and, you know, any other kind of old crazy <laughs> stuff. And I'm just going to act like they're brand new. Like it's a, like it's a new thing. <laughs> I remember being blown away by the first time I saw a water level. And I'm pretty sure I was in grade school and I was seeing it on this old house and, uh, you know, some things still work. This comes from Paul in Northeast Ohio. Hey, podcast team, I'm planning stages for a new master bath in an existing house built in 1981 and located in, nor in Northeast Ohio. The old master bath will be converted to a walkout closet, oh, excuse me, a walk-in closet once the new bath is finished. That will allow me to work at my usual snail's pace without too much inconvenience or too many divorce initiating events. <laughs> Two walls of the bath will be exterior and my question concerns how to handle the, those walls. The exa existing exterior walls are half-inch sheetrock, two-by-four studs on 16-inch centers, one-inch rigid foam, EPS, I think, a layer of felt paper, paper, horizontal furring strips, and vertical channel rustic cedar siding, craft face fiberglass bats in the cavities. You may have noticed there's no mention of sheathing because there isn't any conventional plywood sheathing. There may be lead embracing in the corners, but I don't know because I haven't done any work in the corners yet. My preliminary design allows me to avoid any plumbing in the exterior walls, but the side wall of the shower will be an exterior wall. The shower will likely be solid surface material as ease of cleaning is a priority objective for the project. The rest of the bath will likely be tiled at least halfway up the wall. Of course, the solid surface and tile areas will have proper backing and waterproofing behind them. Finally, to the question, what wall assembly should I use to avoid problems caused by solid surf or tile on the inside and rigid foam on the outside? Seems to me there is essentially no drying potential in either direction. Is filling the cavities with closed cell foam the only real option? If so, I will hold my nose and do it. Thanks for the advice, Paul. 
Well, what a great question. When you have two virtually impermeable surfaces, what do you do for drawing? Jeff, what do you do? Uh, well, first of all, he said it's EPS. So EPS actually does have some porosity to it. Oh, quit splitting hairs here, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff is totally right, though. Absolutely. You get a little drawing with EPS. Keegan, Ian, you got thoughts on this? Go ahead, Keegan. Uh, yeah, that's it's a tough one. I would, I really don't like spray foam, but um, I would say this might be a, might be a, sp a spot where that would make sense. It's not a big area, so it shouldn't cost too much. Um, but yeah, we're we're gonna use a product called Tadalact, which is kind of a lime plaster in our showers. Sim might be similar to something that he's looking into, but I don't know that. I mean, of course, you're waterproofing behind it, so I think he's got a great question. Yeah, I say don't worry about it. Who cares? Like, how's it gonna get wet? It, like, vapor can't go through the tile area or the shower area, right? Uh, if 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 there's reasonable detailing on the exterior, uh, water shouldn't be getting into the wall. I don't, I don't know. I think cut and cobble is another option if you don't yeah. want to spray foam, right? Cut pieces of rigid insulation and, and uh, seal the perimeter to the, the framing. Um, but honestly, I mean, this is a common thing. This is, this is uh, you know, not, all, not everything is a problem because uh, the water's got to come from somewhere. So assuming you're not getting water from the tile side, Seems hard to imagine with uh, a solid surface, especially, and uh, you have reasonable water management on the outside. Seems like not going to be an issue. Am I wrong? I am, could, I, am I letting them off the hook? No, I think you could use mineral <laughs> wool too. I think that's a great, great spot yeah. to use mineral wool. That's something that can stand getting a little bit wet uh, over time if you do have a failure in your waterproofing or your solid surface. But I want to give Paul a shout out for having his priorities in order because in my mind, when mm. you're going to take on a project, you have four priorities. Don't hurt yourself. Don't go broke. Don't get divorced. <laughs> do the best job you can in that order. <laughs> I'm going to get that on a t-shirt and make a gazillion dollars. That is fantastic. And sound advice. I think it's easy to lose sight for uh, handy folk and home building types to forget of the stresses uh, you may be causing your family members who are, um, see what you're doing as entirely scary. Uh, you, you know, folks are not used to seeing like walls torn down or uh, huge messes or, you know, pipes being soldered. Any number of the things that home building types do can be very scary to folks who are not familiar. So. It's good to keep their feelings and thoughts in mind. How did he describe it? Not uh, avoiding divorce initiating events, I think was what he said. <laughs> uh, so Keegan, we got a, a few minutes here. Uh, can you talk briefly about how you ended up in Sandpoint like uh, every other Californian? Uh, and um, we'll talk more <laughs> about your business and work after, after the show. Yeah, sure. Um, well, we, we were lucky. We decided to move up here uh, a couple of years before the rest of them all came up, um, or the rest of us, I should say. Uh, we moved in 2017. Um, just basically looking for a place where we might be able to afford to buy a house in our lifetime and uh, somewhere that had some water, uh, wasn't under wildfire threat all the time. And uh, I have some family up here and it's beautiful and it's got a ski mountain and mountain biking and all the things we like to do. So uh, that's that's how we ended up here. Yeah. And, and just Were there before, other places on you know, your uh, short COVID. list of places to move to? Uh, mostly Oregon, or as you say, Oregon. Uh, <laughs> I haven't said that in a long time. Uh, yeah. I want to, or maybe I did. I, I know, know you've gotten a lot better about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, there's quite a few awesome spots in Oregon. And, uh, so we had, we had crisscrossed Oregon, um, but ended up up here and I'm really glad we did. And you mentioned that, uh, affordability. I'm guessing Sandpoint doesn't jump to most folks' lists of affordability. 
uh, nationwide, but uh, was I'm guessing it was less expensive, at least at the time, than Northern California. Did you own a house in Northern California uh, that you sold? We did not. No, we were uh, living at the house I grew up in and working for rent for my dad and saving money to, to buy a place. Uh, and then we moved up here, and about six months later, we bought a place, but it was 35 minutes out of town. So it was affordable, but it wasn't the wasn't our forever home necessarily. Um, and then things just went crazy, and uh, we've made some moves since then. Um, but it's worked out great for us as far as the real estate side of things. We got really lucky. Uh, I, I look forward to talking to you. Uh, about your business, your home build, what it's like to build in such a snowy place. Like, uh, how much snow does Sandpoint get in the wintertime? It's more than 100 inches, as I recall. Yeah. Um, yeah, but the it's interesting. The town is very close to the lake, and it's a big lake, um, and the lake holds a lot of heat. So the town itself, it'll snow heavily, and then it kind of melts Um Right now, there's no snow in my front yard except in the shade. Hmm. Um, so maybe not as snowy as the numbers say, I guess, but there's a lot of kind of microclimates as you head out of town, depending what side of the hill you're on. And then up at the ski mountain, which is about 4,000 feet higher than us, uh, they're just, they just get hammered up there. It's, yeah, it's crazy. A lot of snow. So are you in zone five, six, or seven? We are zone six, and I think six A maybe, but uh, zone six, yeah, is what I base everything on. Yeah. Wow, that's uh, we'll put a um, link to your company's website uh, on the podcast page so folks can see what your uh, company does. And uh, but I hope everyone will stay tuned for the Fine Home Building podcast after show for our members of Fine Home Building All Access. And uh, I think it's going to be a great conversation. There's going to be a lot of... Um, I, I'm looking forward to picking your brain about building your own house because I think uh, it's interesting um, when builders have to build their own stuff and make all the decisions that ordinarily their clients have to deal with. So uh, we'll walk through some of those choices. Do you guys have anything before yeah. we, we go that we want to talk about? Ian, I who's I up? I want to see some water level pictures on Instagram now. I'm, I'm <laughs> fascinated by this idea of people using water levels on job sites. Have you ever? Once, yeah. Once. And I think it was actually an apprenticeship school, uh, if I'm not mistaken, when they were trying to uh, show us all different kinds of tool options to do the same thing. Uh, it's pretty clear why lasers have largely supplanted uh, water levels in all but the most weird circumstances. Yeah. Uh, Hashtag yeah. water level, people. Come on. <laughs> Ian, I'm curious if uh, in our climate you'd have to use something other than water. I mean, four or five months I think you would. You'd have to year. use antifreeze. It'd be a spirit level, actually. Yeah. Just, uh, old school. <laughs> Can you imagine telling your client that the reason their house is all out of whack is because your water level was frozen, right? <laughs> Sorry, we had to use our... to keep a bunch of Jack Daniels on the job site to use the water level, right. I guess. Yeah, we had to use our vodka. We had to use our vodka level today. Sorry. <laughs> uh, well, I want to thank all of our Fine Home Building podcast listeners who really make the show what it is with your comments and questions. Uh, and it makes it fun because we get to hear from a bunch of different people all over the country. And, uh, once again, if you know of anyone who's working on brick townhomes and urban parts of the, or suburban parts of the, uh, the nation, I would love to talk to them about their work because it is something that I feel like, uh, we haven't done as good a job as we could, uh, covering. So I hope we can make up for that in the near future. Well, unfortunately, that is all the time we have for today. Thanks to Ian, Keegan, and Jeff for joining me. And thanks to all of you for listening. Please remember to send us your comments, questions, and suggestions to fhbpodcast at taunton.com. And please like, comment, or review us however you're listening. It helps other folks find our podcast. Stay safe, everybody. Keep Craft Live. Stay tuned for the after show. 